Okay. Hallelujah. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, Hamid. Excellent. Hi, Estefan. Hamid, the, uh, Hamid, I've got to say, it's also the first time I've ever done it. It's okay. So it's a little new for me, and I've had to build this little contraption here yeah, to okay. uh, connect my phone with uh, um, uh, hair elastic bands yeah. and everything. But anyway, it's okay. great. Thank you. Thanks so, for accepting our interview request. It's great to see you here. And I made an introduction, but I want to make 30 seconds another introduction about you. Uh, Stefan Antoni is the director of uh, SAUTA, a design office based in Cape Town, South Africa. They are famous with their residential and commercial projects. And here you are. Uh, would you like to say hello to our followers? Yeah, well, hello to all the viewers. Um, wonderful that you've joined us. It's a new thing for us as well. Um, and look forward to sharing some ideas with you all. Love it, love it. Okay, I'll jump into my questions. Uh, sure. First of all, could you introduce yourself and your office so uh, uh, to our audience? Okay, well, uh, my name is Stefan Anthony. Um, our architectural company is uh, Sayota, as you've mentioned. We actually have four companies, so we sell to the architects. We are Arc Interior Designers, Interior Architecture and Interior Decor. Then we also Ochre, which is a furniture store, and uh, a new company called Tenebris Lab, which uh, does Lux Walker virtual reality. So if any of the viewers want to at some point just Google um, any of those. And, for, uh, and just quickly on that, let me quickly just punt the Lux Walker thing. The virtual reality for us, for our office, has totally changed the whole way we see design and we see architecture. So it's mind blowing. I, you know, I, I say to many people, um, but most people don't even remember fax machines. But the first time yeah. I ever saw a fax machine, it was the most mind blowing thing I ever saw. <laughs> so for me, virtual reality is now equivalent to that. It's so the first time that, yeah, you're sorry. Presenting pro you're presenting your project in virtual reality as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, most of our clients now, we, we are based in Cape Town, so we can meet them in the model. And so we arrange wow. a time to meet. You know, it could be a few people because it doesn't have to be in one place only or two places. So we can meet a, a client from New York. Uh, uh, the wife might be in Geneva. We in Cape Town and we meet inside the model and it's virtually realistic as well. If you want to plant trees, you want to change the lighting, everything, it's remarkable. So I think uh, in, any of your viewers, if you've got a chance, look it up. It's, it's a game changer for us. Exactly, exactly. Uh, what was your reason? So, so, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so for, let, for, let, for let me just quickly show. introduce. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we are a company of just over about 200 people. Um, the, there are six of us directors in Sota, And I just want to mention them by name because they're all very important. Greg Truen, Philip Olmsdahl. Philippe Fouché, Mark Boulevant, and Logan Gordon, who's our fin uh, financial director, and then, of course, myself. So, um, you know, we, we've been around since 1986, so we, we still feel that we're the kids, uh, new, new kids on the block, I but Mark. I think we've been around <laughs> quite a while. But, um, no, and we actually recently, we, we just uh, worked out that we've worked in 86 countries, countries and 143 or so cities around the world and yes. on six continents. I was so going I must down say, there into your project and I saw a lot of, like more than 300, right? More than 300 well, projects? Well, those are, only, those are only the ones that we've surfaced. And of course, unfortunately, most of the most exciting ones we cannot actually show, which oh. is such a pity, but that's the way things go. Or yeah. we can when they eventually built, but Sometimes it takes years for these projects to actually materialize. Right, right. And then, okay. and then just, I think, I think just as another last comment, I, want, I just want to say, I think for us also, um, we, we really try to strive for, for a good balance. Okay, a good balance between a quality of life and quality of the work we do. And I think that's, that's important and that's the kind of culture that we have in our office. Exactly, exactly. So uh, what was the reason you chose architecture profession? And what is the journey that you become an architect? Well, look, for, for me personally, it's, of course, different to, to all our, all our other, other directors. But for me, when, when it came to the end of my schooling, my father had chosen that I must be an engineer. 
And I suddenly realized in the year that I was going to start university that I was not, I didn't want to be an engineer. Right. So I just, I just decided, let me think of anything in my life that stirred me, that did something that moved me. And I remember when I was about 11 years old in 1974, um, we, we happened to be in Poland. Um, and at the time it was under communist rule and it was a winter. And I remember a tobogganing down the stairs of this huge cathedral in Krakow called, called Nova Huta, which was under construction. And then I went inside this structure under construction. And do you know when the air is all like white and milky and there's right. these shards of light coming down? Exactly. And really, I've got goosebumps now as I talk about it because it was something that totally moved me. And, and it actually remained with me. So when I was deciding eventually, I had to make a decision. What do I want to do? I realized that's actually something that stirred me and it got me excited. So that's how I landed up doing architecture. Doing architect, architecture. Which, was, which year was it? You became an architect like after graduation? Which, which, we, which yeah, year? So, so I finished in 1985. Yeah. And 1985, it was uh, economically very bad in South Africa at the time. So I worked for about a year, just under a year. And, uh, and you know, there wasn't much work. So yeah. then I went on my own because I had a few small little jobs. Mm -hmm. And then, and you know, the whole idea was at the time, I wanted to just do these jobs and then right. I wanted to go find myself <laughs> because I'd read the book Fountainhead and yeah, it wasn't, Fountainhead. wasn't turning out the way that I'd read it in the book. It was a lot exactly. tougher. So <laughs> exactly. the whole idea was that I was going to um, just do these little jobs, find myself, decide to uh, maybe change course or something. And then it just got busy and busy. And here we are today. Yeah. Uh, with this pandemic period, how has COVID-19 affected your office, Sauta? Well, look, we, we, we are very lucky as architects. I mean, we, we can actually work remotely, unlike builders and many other fields where you've got to be physically on exactly. site. Exactly. So, so that's a huge advantage. Um, look, I, I think we definitely miss the energy of, of being in an office. We also have the most beautiful view of Table Mountain from our office. So, awesome. so, of course, we all miss that. But, um, no, no, look, I think the thing is that we, we actually had been discussing working remotely for quite a long time because we, 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 we regularly have staff asking, you know, they've got small children and things like that. So it's been on, on, on our agenda. Yeah. Um, and also because we've been, we, we, we do quite a bit of work in China, we realized that the situation was very serious. So I think quite a bit before anybody else actually started putting plans into action, we, we started preparing for something like this. And, and then we made a decision. And overnight, we moved the office. And like within 24 hours, like the vast majority of the office was running. There were little teething problems like uh, internet uh, speeds and things like that. But, but, but we were very quick to actually get going. And we're actually finding it surprisingly effective. In fact, a lot of people in our office are saying they've prefer working from right. home because, because there's less uh, distraction. I mean, other people say there's far more distraction because of kids and other issues and things like that. But, but it's definitely working well. I, th I think there's no question if this were 15 years ago uh, or even 10 or even maybe five years ago, technology wouldn't have been what able to answer? handle something yeah, like this. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, right. in fact, you know, even things like BIM 360 for us, um, it's just suddenly just worked. And in fact, we, we were discussing it for years and, and, and a year ago, it actually wouldn't have worked for us. But right now, the technology has caught up and, it, and it's working for us. Great. So, you know, we, 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 we also are, are trying to make the whole experience of working at home as close to working in the office. So we, we, we regularly um, have sessions, what we call RAD sessions, which is uh, a research, analyze, and design. It's, 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 a, it's a process where a team presents a project and all the directors and anybody else interested can log in. Okay, so we normally have it, have it in our canteen, which is a beautiful space, but now we do it online in teams. And that works very, very well. We actually came up with a new idea this week, um, something that we're calling Blink, which is uh, really? on Friday. On Friday, every team, and we have, we have eight teams. Eight, you know, there are eight teams, and within those teams, there's sub-teams, but there are eight main teams. 
So on Friday, everybody gets a five-minute little slot to just share the projects that they're on, any new projects that they've picked up along the way, any ideas that they've discovered, any social things, like if somebody's had a baby or maybe somebody's got married during, during lockdown. So, so it's just a way to actually connect the office so we don't feel isolated because that's the one thing I think everybody definitely feels. Exactly. That, we, that we're a little bit far from each other. You don't see each other, other enough. And, and you almost want the experience of walking around the office looking over somebody's desk, asking them a question, what are you doing? Oh, well, that looks cool. And then it inspires you in your work. Exactly. What do you, how do you think this pandemic would affect the architecture world, like our life itself, yeah. social relations, our up, in the upcoming years? Sure. I, look, I think there are going to be substantial changes. First of all, on a kind of slightly more lighthearted note, I think... Uh, Face masks are going to become like sunglasses um, because I exactly. think everybody, yeah, right. and, and, and yeah, I, I think, I I think totally it's something that, that. that, yeah, so, so I think uh, every, it's going to take a long time for people to fully recover from something like this. They're always going to be cautious. I don't think I'm going to um, rush into any crowded place where everybody is squeezed up and sweaty and breathing and coughing. I think somebody coughing is going to be a big yeah, warning big sign. You're going to want to almost run away. Yeah, big I mean, trouble. something interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just, oh my gosh, just like <laughs> stay away or so. No, no, but, but, but even something I saw fairly recently was uh, um, people not wanting to touch door handles and somebody had suggested foot handles. So at the bottom of the door, you just right. use your foot and you pull the door open. And if you think about it, I suppose it depends on how quickly and how effectively corona can be resolved and, let's say, some cures found for it or some vaccinations found for it. But if it is yet to stay, as it, there's a good chance it will be, I think we're going to have to be a lot more careful about it. Um, look, I also think in, from an architectural point of view, it's also going to change maybe the way that we're going to be designing projects, uh, designing houses. I think houses are going to have to be set up even for better working conditions in that uh, if there are more scares like this or more situations like this in the future, um, people will just move straight into their work situation, into their homework situations. So I think, I think that, that'll be one of the changes. Yeah. Um, Look, I, I, I think at the same time, there are fundamental issues on a greater level that really need to be resolved. Um, I think society is far too unbalanced. Um, I think uh, resources and facilities are not uh, adequately, uh, adequately provided. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's like the weakest link in all of this that is always going to eventually result in the problem, and that's got to be resolved. Mm -hmm. I think society is so, so unbalanced today. So hopefully this will also wake up people to question and to think more and to analyze, find better solutions. I must say at the same time, I'm also a little bit overwhelmed by all the fake news and all the conspiracy news that is flooding us all the time. And it's in a way difficult to start seeing who you can trust. So, so there are lots of lessons that are going to come out of this. Hopefully lots of good lessons. Exactly. So what are the main factors that guide you through the project? Well, okay. Look, I think the... the Actually, the this is a thing, general question. There's types yeah. of projects like residential, the healthcare. I'll ask about yeah. that as well. No, yeah, but yeah. Generally. Well, look, I think, I think for us, um, I mean, whether it's a residential project or a high riser or yeah. something in between, you know, for us, it's never really about a style. Right. Okay, we, 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 we try to not have a formula in our office. We mm -hmm. try to have an attitude. Okay, and, and, and I think what we've, we've got a, a lot of um, people involved with design. It's not like a top little group of people call the shots or have written a, f a formula that everybody right. must stick to. We, we, we encourage everybody, even, even students who come join us on internships or uh, graduates that have just finished, we want them to be involved and to challenge us. So we want them to understand what we stand for, what our DNA is, what we believe in, but we want them to challenge us. And you know, very often that's a role that our seniors play. 
in that we will give younger designers a chance, but we're quite critical. And those, and those, and those rad sessions are brilliant that way. And like very often, there'll, there'll be a question that will pose that's virtually, but you have not advanced the thought further. You have done what the client asked for, but the client has only asked for that because that's all he's seen. Exactly. And you haven't questioned yourself further to see how you can move the whole debate further. Exactly. And I think that's facing, where it gets very exciting. Exactly. Facing challenges leads to creativity, actually. That's the main Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and in fact, if you regurgitate the stuff that you do all the time, you're going to get stale, right. you're going to lose clients, and you're going to get bored. So I think we very much encourage that, that um, students, uh, oh, I mean, all the designers, because it's from the most senior to the most junior, mm -hmm. that don't question. I think, I, think, I think that's probably the most important one word that we use in office. Ask right. the right questions. Interrogate things. Challenge us. Challenge yourself, because that will lead to something better. Look, at, at, at the same time, I mean, all the usual things have to be taken into account. You've got to take into account the site, the context, uh, if there's a historical context or cultural context. Um, you've got to take the client's brief and, and budgets into account. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's lots and lots of factors. Um, I don't think it's a linear process. I think a lot of what we, have, what we do is intuitive, but, but in intuition there's also a danger that you're not challenging yourself enough. So we very often, before we go too far, we will stop and have these rad sessions, these are group yeah. challenges. And, and if something is not moving in the direction that we know is going to be very special, it gets ripped apart, which is great. That's right, that's right. Actually, I saw in the comments your project, Krish Pharma Healthcare, and uh, I would like to ask about that one as well. Sure. Looking into this project in Weidmark, Germany, actually, when we look at it, the area where the project is located, we see that it is located in an, in an anonymous industrial zone without any distinctive context. How did this strong geometry image uh, emerge in this place with the weak context. Yeah, well, look, okay, so, so, so that's a perfect example of a site that had virtually no clues. And yes. no, well, the context was so weak and so miserable. Exactly. And, and, and as a greenfield site, and here's this opportunity to do something. So look, I, I, I think the first decision for us was that, that we wanted it to be a sculptural object in the landscape. Okay, so, so we wanted it to have a strong architectural statement that was about object because it was too far from any other building to actually relate to something. So it was a standalone piece of sculpture. Um, at the same time, look, I think we, we, we um, looked at the company logo, the company, uh, the brand, and and of course, because it's so specific for that company, and because it's a showpiece for that company, um, we felt let's use even even the shapes of the logo to inspire the building. So that led it to being a kind of faceted geometric decision. Well, well, the decision to pursue something that was faceted and geometric, and then it was about how can you make something that is quite in a way futuristic because you, you're trying to promote that, that what happens in this building is groundbreaking, looking after the future, caring about the future, but also that it has soul and it cares about the people inside. So there was this whole balance that we are playing. So while the building is almost science fictional in some ways, it's very, very endearing at the same time, because when you come walk under this large canopy and you look on the underside and it's got this lovely soft belly of the red, which is a corporate color as well, but you really f feel as if you are being like hugged by the building. So, so it works as, a, as an architectural form on the one hand, but it also works as a, well, also functionally because when it rains, you've got a shelter, 
If you want to go out and have a walk, you, you, you're also undercover, but it also has a very welcoming quality to it. So I think that, that we, we, we had to create all our own context and our own rules on how to make this building work. Exactly. Um, it's also made of two parts. So there's the factory building, which is the rear part, which is just a very, very pure rectangle. Um, so we just had to clad that, but in cladding it, we also clad it very carefully to tie up with the, with the incisions that we have in the front of the building. So, um, and then the building in the front was really reception and the offices. And that, again, we wanted to be very transparent. So when you arrive, especially in Germany in winter on a dull day, this, this building glows beautifully because it glows through the glass. You can see the people inside. It's not like a secret um, pharmaceutical factory building. It's, you can see the people inside. You can see the people living and working inside. Um, it's got the lovely red glow. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, and, and, and it just creates a kind of human c connection and touch to the building. That's right. You talked about the balance. Actually, I, I, I would like to ask about the uh, Lepine House in Central of yes, yes. France. And uh, uh, somehow in this project, you try to relate into uh, Mediterranean architecture as well. But uh, regarding the references and its geometry and the climate, uh, how was this balance established? Yeah, okay. Well, well, you know, that's another interesting example because now you have a very strong context in a way because if you exactly. take Saint-Tropez, everybody knows the, the, the uh, uh, town of Saint-Tropez and the character of Saint-Tropez. Now, it's a little bit different when you are uh, many kilometers away from the center of Saint-Tropez, but you're still in the Saint-Tropez environment and culture. And now how do you address it? Now, being modernists, you know, we, we would never want to mimic what is currently there, the, 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 the uh, traditional language, literally. So we would always want to question and challenge it. Now, I, I mean, I love I mean, a lot of tradition. I mean, yeah? the, the, the connection of tradition and the new in this project, what is it actually? What is the, well, the thing that you call tradition and the new that you have brought into the project? Well, okay, look, let, let me put it this way. You know, many <laughs> traditional buildings are beautiful, Absolutely. But many also bad, but many also bad, because many, the openings are too small, um, the spaces are gloomy, the right. interiors and the exteriors very often don't actually connect. Now, in a, in a residential building, you know, there are some fundamentals that you must get right, okay? You, if, especially if you, yeah, so, so, you know, I think that's where contemporary and modern architecture, for me, when handled well, is superb because it really breaks down those boundaries, especially between interior and exterior, where you don't have an object just placed on a site, where you use the whole site. I think that's something that we also, it's very important for us, that we, that, that we don't regard the building as the building. We regard the site as the experience. So we try to lengthen your experience from inside to semi-indoor outdoor to outdoor to garden to beyond. Okay, so it's that layering that is very important. But but okay, coming coming back to the context. I mean, over here, it's first of all the the, the climate in Saint Tropez, especially in summer, is amazing. So so you you want to live indoor outdoor seamlessly. So 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 that's. The, so again, when you say context, context is not necessarily an architectural style or look. Context is also just the climate, just the place, just the Understood. surroundings, right. the trees, the landscaping. So that was one aspect which I think we addressed quite strongly. I mean, another aspect for us was the, that the wall architecture of Saint-Tropez is also very special. So, so where we needed or where we wanted more privacy or where we wanted more mystery, we made those, those facades very much more solid. So, for instance, when you arrive at this building, you arrive in, the, in the, like a garden, you walk through stepping stones in the garden, that whole facade, which the neighbor does look into, 
is very closed, okay? And it's, it's got the quality of a lot of traditional buildings in Saint-Tropez. But as you come to the entrance, okay, and, and, the, and the entrance is quite understated, so we're almost like playing down the whole experience, but it's quite magical coming up the stairs to the main entrance. And then when you come through the front door, then you come out into this beautiful, huge, huge double yes. volume sculptural space. Actually, and it's impressive. I, I, I'm watching the videos and the photos right here. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. So that, and, and there again, on the ceiling, for example, it's an off shutter concrete ceiling. Yeah. And there we wanted to pick up again for us, which was like a Mediterranean feel, a kind of exactly. chalky textural quality. So, so, so very sublimely, we are carrying on that feel of Saint Tropez and, and the Mediterranean, but it's exactly. not an overt thing. It's a subtle thing. Right, right. So I'll ask about user experiences in your Beyond project. Uh, with yeah. this form and the design, the spaces and the concept, how was the uh, user experience for this project? And okay, general, well, actually, well, generally, in your own yeah, project, yeah, yeah, yeah. more residential, yeah. what are the feedback and the comments from the users? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well. Beyond is a little bit different because Beyond is my house. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. So, 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 at the end of at 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 at, at the end of this um, uh, video, what we'll do, I'll just lift my little um, prop that I have here. And I'll quickly just take you downstairs, and then you can have a look. Love okay. It. So, are, you so, that, are you there right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I'm here right now. Oh, okay. Cool. So I'm. But so if I can just share this with you. So, 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 so when I designed it, you know, I I wanted to have a great office space, not knowing that I'd be confined during a during a pandemic in the exactly. space. It was me more just for weekend work or evenings. So exactly. I have the most magical office you can imagine. So I'll show you a little bit later on. So, wow. and I'm on the mezzanine of the main living level. Okay. And for right. me, why it's special. And that's what I've always tried to do is um, when I'm in the office, I don't want to be in a closed off space. I want to be part of the action. I want to be removed that I can get on with my, my work. If I want silence, I'll put headphones on. But I still want to see what's going on, and I don't want to feel that I'm missing out. So that's why it's a very special spot, <laughs> yeah. and I'll show you just now. So, no, okay, um, uh, Beyond is, is quite an unusual uh, project because, first of all, it's for me, and second of all, it was a very, very steep site. And, and I'll show you just now when we, when we um, at, at, the, at the end of the session. So, so I have the mountain right on the left-hand side here, and I've got Lion's Head, which if you come to Cape Town one day, you, you, I'll take you love up it. Lion's Head. It's incredible. Would love so it. I've got a view of Lion's Head there and a view of a very famous Beach Clifton to my right here. Right. And, uh, but, but, but the most important thing about this house was that you, you had to get the living level up very high to engage with the mountain. Otherwise, the living level would have been in like a black hole. So, so what it resulted in is that every one of the levels is actually a double volume level. And, and that actually led to a lot of challenges. I must say at the time when we were building and I came on site very regularly and I used to stand here, especially in the middle of winter, and I used to look at these volumes. And there's one volume here that is about uh, 12 meters because it's yeah. two double levels double linked level. up. Right, right. And I remember standing there one cold, cold winter morning with the builders looking up here and thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Thank goodness <laughs> I haven't got a client because they would fire me now. <laughs> but anyway, but, but eventually it all came together and, and, and I must say it's quite a stirring, dramatic s series of spaces. So look, I think, I think Beyond is really just an interplay of forms and volumes. It's quite modernist. In fact, when I, when I was looking, looking for inspiration, I was looking at some of the brutalist work from the 60s and 70s, or 70s and 80s, um, and, and, and I wanted the building to be very raw, 
very simple. Um, I always knew it was going to be a family house, so it had to be intimate and cozy for a family, but it also had to handle functions and things like that. So we've had quite a few office functions here. We've had a wedding here. We've had a um, – it's been used – gets used sometimes for shoots and movies and things like that. And, and, and because it's my house, of course, I can play and I can experiment with things. So, exactly. so it definitely pushed some boundaries. Um, I mean, I'll show you a little bit later on. You can just see behind me maybe – there's a concrete ceiling here. Exactly. I see. And, yeah. And then, and then, so what we did is we took the, the planks um, from the ceiling and we used it on, on the level below on the ceiling there. And, and what was beautiful about it is those planks, after a month and a bit standing in the rain, holding the concrete, got pickled. So they got this most beautiful, beautiful patina to them. And in most situations, you would throw that wood away. And exactly. in this situation, for me, it was special to actually reuse it, and it's one of the features of one of the levels below. Exactly. Love it, actually. So when we look at all of your projects, they are all including very rich materials and good lightning, very de great definition of space. And uh, could you tell us about the use of the materials in, this, in, in, the, in your projects and how you are trying to reinterpret the definition of space with these rich materials and good yeah, lightning no, uh, as well? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, okay, let, let, let me just clarify something here because, you know, for, for me personally, I like raw materials. For, for, for many of us architects, we love raw materials. Like with yes, its but what, concrete. What do you think? Yeah, the raw concrete, yeah, it, it's perfect. It's perfect, but... Uh, but. Yes, but. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you see, the thing is, the thing is, and it's interesting because, like, regularly clients will come to Cape Town, our overseas clients will fly to Cape Town, and they'll say, oh, can we see a few houses? And, you know, they'll often come to my, our house. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and of, yeah, and it's interesting. Some clients absolutely love it, and some people say, well, when are you going to finish the house? You know, I see you've got it's all finished. this concrete <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, no, 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 but that's the finish I want. So, no, okay. So I think what I'm trying to say is that, that, that you've got to choose materials to suit the project and the client. And in some cases, the materials are rich as in rich and expensive. In other cases... They are raw and simple, and and both have great um, merits. Right. But of course, one doesn't fit all, and that's yeah. where I think it's so important to understand the client. Um, if anything, we've started playing down the richness of materials to look more for the character of materials. Um, and I think that's something again. Uh, we do get a lot of comments about our work in that it is quite modern, well, it is modern, it's quite edgy, but it still is warm and humane and friendly. And I think that's something that for us is very important. We, we, we never want to, you know, I remember many of the modernist works from 20, 30 years ago, especially when I was studying as a student in the first years, you know, they would, they'd be very hard. The tiles would be gray or white, uh, the floors, the wall finishes would be super hard. I think people have matured People are far more literate. People um, are far more demanding. And, they, and, 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 you know, luxury today is a lot of things. I think that's something you're going to ask me just now. So we'll yes. leave that one for, for later. <laughs> exactly. But, but um, okay, so that's the one side. And then the other side, of course, uh, you asked the question about light. Um, for us, sun is so, so important. I think maybe many, many years ago when, when there wasn't advanced quality glass and, and, and you would freeze in, in winter and things like that, we were forced to maybe have smaller openings. But today, with, 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 with uh, high, high uh, qualities of glass, um, you, 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 can, you can have larger openings. I mean, in, 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 in Russia, for instance, in winter when it's minus 40, 50 degrees, that it's 
three or four layers of glass, but you can still have a beautiful relationship to the outdoors. So, so for us, at all levels, light and sun is the most important thing. I think it's got a great psychological impact on, on, your, on your being. Um, and, and like for me, for example, I love west sun. You know, many people don't like west sun, but west sun is the most beautiful setting sun. But of course, you've got to manage it. So you manage it with screens and trellises and, and things like that to, and planting to create a beautiful dappled light. Now, that beautiful dappled light is exquisite. So, so you know, wet light used well is exceptional. Right, right. Impressive. Uh, how does working with different styles, with different scales in different geographies, how affected your architecture and your work style in Sauta? Yeah, well, well look, I think, I think we, we, we're very fortunate in working in um, so many diverse places. You know, we, we, we start, started working overseas probably about 20 years ago in Spain, first of all. Um, then we started doing a lot of work in West Africa. And we still to this day are doing, uh, um, in fact, our client from West Africa from 15 years ago um, is still one of our main clients. And we've now done probably dozens and dozens of amazing projects for him. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, it's totally different because the skills levels are different, the materials, the way you build. But to a large extent, building is similar everywhere in the world. Okay, so, so even though the materials uh, might be uh, a little bit different and the sizes might be a little bit different, um, it's, it's much of a muchness. Building is, is building. I mean, you need a roof. You have to protect from the weather and things like that. So, look, I, I think the main thing, we always just say, you know, you've got to question where you're working. You've got to understand the cultures, understand the methodologies, um, and then, and then you've got to interrogate it and absorb it into your work and hopefully get it to influence your work. Okay. And that's something right. that we constantly now are challenging ourselves. How can we do something that is forward looking, forward thinking, but of its place and, and really sets an example for the people in those places to adopt? So I think that's one of our challenges that we are setting ourselves for the future. Right. You've traveled and you've designed in many cities around the world. And what do you think? Which city is your favorite? The most favorite one? <laughs> well, look, I don't know. Have you Old ever town. been to Cape Town? No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Have Cape you ever town. been to Cape Town? Okay, I'm put it on your list. Put it on your list. Okay, okay. you must come to Cape Town. Because Cape Town, look, we, we, we've all traveled a very lot. Yeah. And, and I must say, every time you come back to Cape Town, you realize it is remarkable. It, it is definitely in the top three cities in the world. So, so I'd, I'd, I'd be lying if I were to say that Cape Town is not probably my number one city. But, you know, I think what, what also interests us are the contrasts. Like, for instance, if you take the energy of Lagos and the energy of New York, okay, they, they, they are such, such different cities. But exactly. the energy is exceptional. And then you take the style of, uh, let's say, Paris and, and, of, and, of, and of Los Angeles. Again, totally, totally different. But they have a presence. They have an influence on the world. And, and they're great places to be. Again, I, I, think, I think we are very blessed as architects. We can visit these cities. We can partake in them. We can contribute to them. We can share and learn um, from, from clients and other architects and on the, all these projects. And then you come back to Cape Town and you can savor all of that and, and kind of quieten down. Because, because the one lovely thing about Cape Town, there, there's a wonderful peacefulness here. So when, when you are working here, in, in, in the winter especially, some people will say, oh, it's a bit too quiet. For us, it's beautiful <laughs> because now it's time when you rejuvenate your soul, your mind, your energy. Right. And no, so but there are lots of beautiful places. Interesting. So with all the projects of, that you have done, how would you define the concept of luxury in architecture? Okay, yeah. So look, I, I think for me probably the biggest luxury is actually position, okay? Because, do you know, if you take, you, you can take the most rustic little 
uh, grass hut on a beautiful beach, and that is luxury. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if you have a beautiful view, a beautiful environment, whether it's trees, nature, or the sea, or something. I think that's the one thing that you can never uh, you, you can never undervalue its position. Right. Um, look, then, I, then again, from an so so again, I think we're very privileged, very often to work on beautiful sites all over the world. Um, so you already got a head start, and you and there's almost like a responsibility on you to actually do something that is exceptional because you're starting with something that's already got a lot of quality. Um, and then the, I suppose for us, what's very, very important is space. And for us, we see space as a bigger luxury than let's say materials, because in many cases we have, again, the, sorry to use the, the, the luxury of creating space. When you're working in a very tight environment mm-hmm. um, and you've got a lot of constraints, sometimes your space has to suffer. And now you've got to focus on materials um, giving it a balance and, 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 and making up for it. So, so I think space is super important for us. We see light as being a luxury in having lots of light, having a setting sun, a morning sun, things like that. And then, of course, um, as I said, materials and attention to detail um, and just co- ease of use or quality of use right. where things work highly efficiently because because that's one thing that I think very demanding discerning people expect that things must work perfectly and you've got to understand that and you've got to study how to improve things again and again exactly so who were your biggest influences in architecture Uh, look I, I always say that that if I look at what the modernists created with our technology the fact that they created these incredible buildings in their minds on drawing boards with pens where they probably could only ever produce two or three or four uh, hand-drawn hand perspectives and, and a couple of crude models. I mean, for me, I'm still totally blown away by that. So, so I think we living in a, at a time where we, we – Architecture, to a large extent, is made so much easier by technology. So having said that, for me, I think, I think uh, when I went to uh, Ron Champ by Le Corbusier, that probably for me was the most one stirring moment after that one that I had when I was a kid. So, so going into Ron Champ, um, it really, really was poetic, breathtaking, spiritual. Um, and again, I think there are very few buildings like that ever, ever created. Ever created. That are timeless, that are unique, that cannot easily, easily. If ever be copied. Exactly. So, so I think those. And then, of course, look, I mean, today there are so many brilliant architects. It's, I'd, I'd have to give you pages of, I mean, we're always looking to see who everybody, uh, who, who's doing what, learning from them. And I, think, and I think the standard of architecture in the world today is exceptionally high. Exactly, exactly. So what do you think a good building is for Sauta? How, do, how would you define a good building? Okay, well, well you know, for, for us, it, it's something that is honest. Um, it's grounded. Um, it's something that must move you. It must give you delight. Um, it's, got to incre- it's got to create value and value right. on many levels. It's got to create financial value. It's got to create spiritual value. It's got to work. Um, it's got to uplift the people, the communities that they are in. It's got to respect its, uh, its environment. Um, yeah, I think, and, and hopefully it can be timeless, and hopefully it never has to be knocked down. Mm-hmm. So, because that's such... I, th- I think all of that with... And sorry. sorry, I got it wrong. And, 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 and I think uh, one of the wonderful privileges of being an architect is that you have this ability to create something virtually out of nothing. You, you, for me, it's almost magic where, where you start with a site, a brief, virtually nothing, and now you can create something 
that will move and change people's lives. Right, right. Impressive. Thank you. And as a closer, uh, what kind of advice would you like to share with young professionals and architecture students as well? Yeah. Okay, well... Actually, you we, are we, yourself we have... a young architect, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I wish. No, no, no. no we, 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 have, uh, we, we love having um, students and interns and, and, and young graduates join us. So we have a lot of youngsters in our office and they are phenomenal. Um, and, but I, th I think the things that we always say to them is number one, have an open mind. Right. Um, have a questioning mind. Um, become literate. You know, that's something I think that's very, very important. I think you need to, you need to uh, um, experience things. You must travel. You must, every, every time we go on a business trip, we always try to add an extra day or so to go see a new building or a new place or something because, because you've got to get literate. And, and very often you only get, you know, one thing is seeing a picture of it. Another thing is being there and really exactly. picking up nuances. So I think that's very important. I mean, we, we, very, we feel very important to be a clear thinker. That's something we, I think a lot of people work in a terribly muddy situation and it's important to be able to just filter all the noise and all the rubbish out and think in a, in a, in a way that is penetrating. Um, so, so and, and again, we want, as I said earlier on, we want people to challenge. So don't take anything as a given. Everything is there to be challenged because everything can be better. So, yeah. Um, and then I suppose also look at the bigger, bigger picture because architecture is, is really a small part of, the world and of society and of the forces that are happening at all times and and we are we we, we yeah i don't awesome. think we are strong as we used to be as architects i think we are much more influential in the past and i think architects have a very very important role to play because i think yeah. we are deeper thinkers than many many other fields and we take into account so many other aspects and what we build is so permanent that we either destroy places or we create wonderful space places. So I think there's a big responsibility on us. And I don't think that you can contribute meaningfully to that if you are not worldly and well-read and involved and aware of things. So I think it's, there's a responsibility on us. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Actually, we have eight minutes to go to finish this uh, interview. Would you like to show us around the Beyond project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. So Give good. good. Let's, I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how this is going to work because I never tested this before. But let's. Okay. So this is. Just from, turn the camera. I don't camera know if you can just see. Just turn the camera. Yeah. Okay. So this is where I've been sitting now. Yeah. Okay. And this wow. is the double volume into our lounge. Love okay. Yeah. That's Impressive. my wife sitting there on the terrace. Ah, great. Okay. I'll. Okay. I had to hang some garbage bags over there to just block the sunset. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> okay. So we're going down to to one of the lounges below, and I think we lost your connection. Okay. Looking. <laughs> At my son and my daughter, yes, yes. can you see I them? I see you. Yeah. Yes, I see them. Say okay. hello to them, to all of them. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> so you can see the, the, the materials and the finishes are very, very simple, very raw. Love it. It's great. Uh, I, think, I think we lost your connection. Uh, the internet is very cool in that side of the house. Hamid, have you got me back? Yes, I got you back. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. So there's okay. the view up to the mountain. So that's where I was saying earlier on that it was very important to get this level, this garden level here, yeah. connected to the mountain. And then, of course, there's our beautiful lion's head. You can just see it over there, which is quite spectacular. It's brilliant. It's really beautiful. And, and then this is my uh, granadella tree, 
as you can see, so I come every morning to pick up my fruit for my breakfast. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Love it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Estefan. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak with you and looking forward for your project as well. And I appreciate Thank you very much. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you Absolute any, pleasure. Any final words to say? No, no, no. Just again, thank you for for what you're doing because I think what's so special about architecture is something you can share, you can discuss, and 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 you created a wonderful platform. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're okay. Welcome. All Goodbye. the best. Have a nice Ciao. Day. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.